بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه يجمعين وبعد Can you guys hear me now? Everything is okay? الحمد لله So as I was saying It's amazing to see all the beautiful faces MashaAllah in this masjid And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless each and every single one of you and the masjid that you've worked so hard to cultivate and to populate. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the seeds that are being planted right now that inshallah will sprout into a strong tree with strong roots of faith, certainty and actions inshallah. The branches and the progeny that are produced from these trees to come, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless those. Because a wise Muslim is somebody who's always thinking about the future. It's not just about focusing on the present, but it's also about what are you leaving behind, the legacy, the progeny, the seeds that are inshallah going to be sprouting long, before, long after we have passed away. And this is a concern that subhanAllah, the anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had with their own progeny, with their own legacy. And we see example after example of this. As for example, Abu al-Anbiya, Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذِ بِتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِنُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا قَالَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ عَهْدِ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the Lord of Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he tested Ibrahim alayhi salam, with test after test after test, and we all know the stories of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. And then when he completed and fulfilled all of them, when he passed all of, this, all of his tests and trials, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that we have made you an imam, a leader for mankind. His immediate concern, his immediate response was, what about my progeny? Is that going to continue after me? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that this covenant will not be extended to those who oppress. So yes, it will continue, but it will only continue to those who have basically followed the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the way of righteousness. And this is the same thing that was the concern of the likes of Yaqub alayhi salam. That on his deathbed, when he was about to pass away, alayhi salam, he had all of his 12 sons around his bed. And he wanted to make sure that his legacy, the legacy of Tawheed, the untainted legacy of monotheism was continue, or is to continue afterwards. And he asked all of his sons at that time, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي who are you going to worship after me? And he wanted to hear, he wanted to confirm that all of the hard work that he had placed in, in raising them and developing them, teaching them, is something that will bear fruit after him. Now, one of the ways to achieve all of the requirements mentioned so far with regards to having a blessed present and then a blessed, af uh, blessed future basically with the progeny and those legacies that come after us. One of the ways to achieve all of that is to basically fulfill the requirements of forging the bonds of brotherhood. Because this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established humanity. Meaning that we will not be able to achieve anything of significance to leave behind us until and unless we fulfill this, this crucial requirement of working together, of unifying of having a collective uh, set of resources that we can use to build something of greater significance than us. This is basically known as the synergy effect. That one plus one is supposed to be more than two. That each individual effort is basically has its weight, no doubt. But then when we come together, the synergistic effects are meant to take place and strengthen and basically create an, an even lasting effect. Something that we could never have achieved individually. Now, when it comes to communal bonds, when we look at how humanity basically uh, bonds itself, unites itself and comes together, there are many ways that humanity does that, by the way. There are patriotic bonds, for example, bonds that are 
tied to the overall land that you've grown up in or were born in. There are also nationalistic bonds as well, which are more ethnic in nature. So for example, the Pakistanis might be together because of that common factor or the Indonesians or the Indians or the Americans and so on and so forth. That's one way that humanity bonds itself. Another aspect is something that is spiritual in nature. Spiritual, but that has no system of life emanating from it. There's no institutions that basically emanate from it. And that's something, the greatest example of that is Christianity. It's a priestly, spiritual uh, union, but it has no system of detailed laws and institutions that come out from it. Then you have other ways that humanity bonds itself, such as, for example, self-interest. So you will see two individuals who see a particular need at any given point in time and they will come together and work together. But that bond also is something that is very limited because as soon as that self-interest goes away, that's it. People basically divide. And then the last way, which is really the most comprehensive way that humanity bonds itself, and that is creed. Creed, a system of life. Basically a set of ideas and from those ideas there are systems that emanate. There's a political system, there's an economic system, there's a social system. There's a system that governs how we teach and educate the masses around us. How do we take care of the, the individual bodies around us and so on and so forth. All of these systems along with the ideas that basically unite us. That is the representation of Islam. The, the creed of Islam that unites. And subhanAllah, we see that bonding and uniting and coming together is something that is historically been one of the most important means of protection for us. We need the communal resources. If we just reflect on our life just for a few moments, take a look at, for example, the beautiful, amazing food that we just enjoyed downstairs. It took maybe thousands of people who had to do their individual work all the way from getting the seeds that were basically cult uh, not cultivated but produced by another company with thousands of workers. And then from the seeds you had to have an entire army of farmers that planted them and then uh, germinated those seeds with water and with nutrients and so on and so forth. And then you had another army of people that had to take the food out. And then after that they had to ship it to uh, the processing centers, and then from there to the grocery stores, from the grocery stores to our homes, from our homes to the places where we serve them. Thousands of people had to come together collectively and work together in order to produce just one meal that we enjoyed after. This is how important it is for us to basically come together and have a mindset of a community rather than just, than, than just uh, an individual pursuit a hedonistic pursuit where we're just focusing on our own selves, our own lives, our own money, our own family, our own wealth. This is not how human life works. That's why the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he emphasized the importance of a jama'ah, of, of congregation. Where from the hadith of Abu Darda, radiallahu anhu, who said that the Messenger said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if three people are in a particular town or in a desert, doesn't even matter if you're in civilization or not. If you're three people or more, he commanded us to establish salah but in a jama'ah. فَعَلَيْكَ بِالْجَمَاعَةِ فَإِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُ الذِّئْبُ الْقَاسِيَةِ He obligated for at least three individuals to establish a jama'ah. Why? Because the wolf eats from the stray lamb. This is basically the parable that the Rasul وسلم, gave, even though the context is that of salah in this particular hadith. But the meaning is extracted for all aspects of life, especially among the Muslims who have united upon the creed of Islam. SubhanAllah, this need of coming together is something that it even extends, like we said, nations or ethnicities or religions. This is something that is deeply rooted in our psychology, in our sociology, in our, in our physical form, in our economic system. Everything basically works together because we are a limited, very limited creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this applies and is rather acted upon. SubhanAllah, unfortunately we have to say this, 
even more so by the non-Muslims than the Muslims. Just a couple of days ago, the United States of America declared $95 billion of aid, really military aid, for three, three particular countries, to Israel, to Taiwan, and to Ukraine. Three nations that are very critical for the quote-unquote unity of the non-Muslims. But look at what the leader of that nation said. Look at what Joe Biden said. He said that if our allies are stronger, then we are stronger. Even they understand the concept that alone they're nothing. They have to work together in order to have that strength emanate among them. And what does that say about us? And we'll discuss a lot more details as to why that is important for us to basically take from before it's too late. Now, the current state, when we look at the current state of the world, at least from an individualistic standpoint, we used to apply this concept of a cohesive community on a regular basis in every aspect of life. Pretty much until, for thousands of years, until the Industrial Revolution took place in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There was a concept that we all know of, that it takes a village to raise a child. This was a very common way that humanity basically supported itself and ensured its protection over time. You had, for example, orphans and divorcees that were taken care of by the families, the extended families, very easily. There was no issue in caretaking of that. If, for example, one of the children was misbehaving in a particular street and the parents were not there to find out, it was the neighbor who used to tell the parents exactly what they did so that they can take care of one another's children, so that they can cultivate, for example, akhlaq among even those who are around them. This was a very common uh, way for us to basically raise ourselves. But after the Industrial Revolution came a very, set, a very specific set of ideas, and those ideas have to do with individualism. This disease of individualism was taught syst systematically to the average person. So now instead of a, a village raising a child, it was narrowed down to a particular family. So now you had, you, you had nuclear families, a husband and a wife and two or three children. And each family basically would take care of one uh, of their own. SubhanAllah, even after and post-individualism. So this after the 1950s and 60s and 70s, we see further degrade, degradation in that. To the extent that it's no longer the individual family unit, but rather it's now the individual itself. So even with the weakening of the, the bonds of marriage between a husband and wife, once that started to take place, now it was basically each fighting for their own provisions, each protecting themselves. The husband only caring about his interests, the wife caring about her interests, and any child that comes out of such a divided state cannot basically fathom, even fathom the concept of unity. For them, it's now survival. They will look after themselves, which is what we're seeing today. We're seeing an epidemic of loneliness. SubhanAllah, you have countries like Japan, where the way that people find out that somebody had passed away was, and this is such an unfortunate reality, SubhanAllah, when you think about it, the only way that they find out, or one of the ways, one of the prominent ways, is that they can smell the deceased individual as their neighbors. They can smell something. So they call the cops, they open the door, and they realize this: there's an elderly individual who passed away a natural death. This is the disease of loneliness that comes from individualism, that is basically destroying the world and crumbling it right in front of our eyes. This is why it is such an important aspect for us to remind ourselves of the importance of the jama'ah, of the community, of ukhuwa, of brotherhood. This is like we said, the primary method for the way that we have protected ourselves as humanity for thousands of years. Just because we have phones now, just because we have cars that allow us to basically travel very easily, it makes no difference. We still need it from a psychological 
sociological, political, economic, physical standpoint, we all need it still. So that's why we're basically taking the time to remind ourselves of the foundations of this concept of the communities and of, and of brotherhood within the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my approach to this inshallah today is going to be to start by identifying some of the causes of disunity first. Some of the causes of the weakening of brotherhood first. And then basically we can address the nature of brotherhood from the Islamic traditions and actually give some real life examples of how the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually implemented those in certain specific initiatives throughout his life. Insha'Allah. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah Ta'ala He identifies and summarizes all of the sources and the causes of disunity and the weakening of the bonds of brotherhood into two causes. And this, these are very important to understand for all of us so that we can prevent it. The first of those two causes is jahl, ignorance. Because we are supposed to unite not just as an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it takes ilm to even understand that this is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there are a lot of people who actually think that this is just a fantasy. That we're just too far, far into the future now and we can never go back to a unified whole. No, this is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the actual method to achieve that is also something that comes with knowledge. And ignorance, the absence of knowledge is something that is very easily a catalyst to become disunited. It's very easy to fight when you don't understand exactly what are the, what are the means upon which we should unite despite having differences of opinion. And which opinions are too far to unite, which is basically the separator and which is something that exists on a gray scale of opinions that all individuals can basically uh, still live in a cohesive manner. This takes knowledge. And the absence of that is something that makes our sensor, that sensor which basically uh, causes us to either be too relaxed and be without any principles, or it can be, make our sensor too sensitive, where any little thing, any tiny little thing, basically makes us say, forget you, I'm going to do my own thing. Forget you, I'm going to make my own masjid. Forget you, I'm not going to work with you because you do this, this, this. These two extremes need to be avoided, and that happens with knowledge. And this is something that, subhanAllah, anything to do with Matters pertaining to the community, matters that are pertaining to a sense of peace and security. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we must take these matters back to the people of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, وَإِذَا جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِّنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوِ الْخَوْفِ أَذَاعُوا بِهِ وَلَوْ رَدُّوهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ وَإِلَىٰ أُولِ الْأَمْرِ مِنْهُمْ لَعَلِمَهُ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَنْبِطُونَهُ مِنْهُمْ SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when there comes to them information related to security and fear related to basically the, the community, these are matters that are pertaining to everybody in the jama'ah. Why do they spread it around? Had it been that they had gone back to the messenger and those who are placed in positions of authority they would have extracted the solution out of it with a level of wisdom. They would have done the istimba. They would have extracted a solution based on knowledge so that it doesn't cause any kind of problems. SubhanAllah, this ayah was revealed when there was a rumor, a false rumor that, that was going around in Medina that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam basically is going to uh, divorce all of his wives. There was a conflict that happened between him and his wives, which we don't have the time to get into. And there was a false rumor that spread that he's going to divorce all of his wives. And people started to talk about it in the masjid to the point where there was disunity that might have actually ensued as a result of that. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he basically goes to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly and he confirms the message. Are you actually going to divorce your wives? He said, no. 
Meaning he basically set the, the tone straight. So he goes out in front of the masjid of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he makes an announcement full that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam is not, make, is not divorcing his wives. And Allah reveals this ayah as a result of that. This is how important, important it is to go back to the messenger, to go back to the people who are in, in charge, who have knowledge, so that they can basically prevent these kinds of issues. The second cause that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala mentions is Baghi, transgression. And this is something that, subhanAllah, it's the jealousy at times. It is jealousy and that destructive sense of competition where we feel like we want to destroy the other person in order to, almost like in a capitalist sense, we're going to put others, others down and then raise ourselves. We see it as like fighting over a pie. In order to have a bigger share, we need to take it from the other side. This is baghi. And this is something that weakens the bonds of, of, uh, of unity, of brotherhood. There's a famous scholar in Medina, Abdullah al-Shanqiti. He said that one of the ways that you can tell if you are sincere is that you are just as pleased if somebody else does something of benefit that causes others to be guided. If, for example, Brother Hamza does something to give da'wah to somebody else. And it's, it's his initiative. And because of that, another brother becomes guided. If I'm sincere, I will feel just as pleased as if I did it myself. This is one of the ways that you can tell if you're sincere. And this is what we need to cultivate. Because just coexisting is something that is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're meant to put these natural instincts that sometimes we might have. We're all weak. We at times might feel a sense of jealousy. But we need to actively work towards purifying the heart so that we don't get into, a, into hasad. We don't get into any kind of destructive competition where we feel like putting another brother in Islam down for his initiatives. We need to see it as a, as a unified whole that if somebody else is harmed, it, it's my loss. Your loss is my loss. Your win is my win. This takes a level of purification in the heart. SubhanAllah, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that unit or disunity rather spread upon this earth after matters were made clear from the scriptures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent. Allah azza wa jalla says in Surah Al-Baqarah وَمَا اخْتَلَفَ فِيهِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ أُوتُهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ after all of the scriptures were sent to the people of knowledge and they had learned it, they had, they had been given all of the bayinat, something that was clear. All of the signs had been, had been made clear to the people of knowledge. That's when they differed. Why? Baghyan baynum. Because they had animosity and jealousy and destructive tendencies in their heart that they refused to basically uh, purify themselves from. So this is the second aspect that we need to basically be mindful of to prevent this unity. Now when we look at, for example, brotherhood from the perspective of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that brotherhood is something that is timeless. It has existed in the past, it will continue in the present, and it will continue in the future as well. Our true unity comes when we look at our creation. Our creation basically went through four stages of existence. The first of those stages was actually in the soul, in the world of the souls. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before he even created the human being, we were a bunch of souls that were living together, unified. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all of them and he asked them, Alastu bi rabbikum? Qadu bala. Shahidina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had asked us all when we were nothing but a bunch of souls that am I not your Lord? All the souls basically in a unified way said yes. They affirmed. They testified to it. That's the first stage of our creation. After that Allah azza wa jal created us as, as human beings in this dunya. In this dunya the mandate is the mandate of unity. Inna hadhihi ummatukum Ummatun wahida, fa ana rabbukum fa'budun. 
You are one ummah, you are a single ummah, a single nation. فَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ so, And I'm your Lord, so worship me. And another version, فَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاتَّقُونَ Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us one of the means of unity, where he says, وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that it is Allah who brought the hearts together. If he, if you, meaning the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you were to spend every single amount of wealth, you will not be able to bring their hearts together. But rather it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that brought the hearts together. Meaning that if we want true unity, we have to seek it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Allah who joined our hearts. It's not basically our ethnicity. It's not the fact that we invite one another to iftars and to our gatherings and so on and so forth. Those are just means afterwards. The foundation of it is, true foundation of true unity is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that if we want a piece of that unity, we have to seek it sincerely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that if somebody says, La ilaha illallah, I say La ilaha illallah, he's upon the sunnah, I'm upon the sunnah, there should be no disunity in that. We have certain rights and obligations and responsibilities that are owed right away. And for anybody who wants to know more about the rights of brotherhood and sisterhood, I did a full lecture on, uh, on that in Mr. Salam, which is recorded and uploaded to my YouTube channel as well. I encourage anybody who wants to know the specific rights, they can go to that particular uh, video insha'Allah. And then after that, subhanAllah, after that will come the day of judgment as the next stage. On the day of judgment, there's no unity at that time. There's no collectivism at that time. On the day of judgment, all of us are going to be individual. فردا, that all of us will come on the day of judgment as individuals. So we have different stages in life. The final of those four stages is in the next life. In Darul Jaza, which is basically paradise or hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us paradise and protect us from hellfire. In paradise, we're going to go back to a state of unity again. Back to a state of brotherhood as well, again. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلٍ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُرٍ مُتَقَابِلِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with regards to the life to come in paradise insha'Allah that he will remove any sense of ghil, any sense of animosity and ill feelings that we have to the point that we will become brethren facing one another and enjoying surah al-mutaqabineen subhanAllah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those individuals Ameen Now let's look at some of the examples and we have a few minutes insha'Allah Let's look at, a, at a, a few examples from the life of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in of how did they actually cultivate and implement brotherhood and unity. We see this for examples with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam subhanallah his whole life. His whole life was basically in pursuit of joining hearts together. Even before prophethood. Even before he was given the message of the Qur'an, he was busy from a perspective of diplomacy to bring the hearts together. And one of the best examples of that is known as the alliance of virtue. Or in Arabic, Hilf al-Fadul. Hilf al-Fadul. Which is basically what happened was there was a Zubaydi, a Yemeni man who came to Mecca wanting to sell some merchandise. He wanted to sell some goods. And he goes to the Kaaba, basically in the city of Mecca, which is the epicenter of the Arabian Peninsula, even at that time because of the Hajj, the institution of Hajj. So this Yemeni man, he goes to Mecca to sell some goods and he ends up selling some merchandise to, to a man, one of the chiefs of Mecca. His name was Al-As ibn Wa'il. Al-As ibn Wa'il basically purchases some of the items and what does he do? He refuses to pay him. He's like, I'm not going to give you any money. Go. What are you going to do? I'm the chief of Mecca. 
This man, this Yemeni man, basically was so disheartened, he was completely bankrupt. He goes to the Kaaba and he stands in front and he says, he makes the announcement public that so and so oppressed me. Who is going to basically now support me? To the point where nobody stood up, subhanAllah. Why? Because the man who oppressed was from among the chiefs and nobody wanted to go against the leaders, among, against the chief. Until the uncle of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa at that time the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa was a, a young child. His uncle Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib, he stands up in, in front of the Kaaba and he says and he yells in anger, how dare nobody support this man? He was so angry. To the point where the chiefs of Mecca basically convened and they got together in the house of a man named Abdullah ibn Jud'an. Abdullah ibn Jud'an basically hosted the chiefs of Mecca and among them was a young Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was before prophethood. And he basically uh, presented the case that no, 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 this is not right. What kind of ghira is this? What kind of shameless behavior is this that somebody can come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be oppressed? So they all came together and basically came to an alliance where they wanted to say, you know what, we will all support one another if anybody's oppressed. This was the alliance of Fudul. And subhanAllah, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even years afterwards, after he was given prophethood, he said that if, any, if there's anything that he would take from the days of pre-Islamic ignorance, it will be this. Because this is what ensured the protection of humanity. That you have one individual here, one individual here, who are willing to come together and protect one another, so that there's no oppression. SubhanAllah, this is something that he was doing even at that time before Prophethood. This is what made him as sadiq al amin the prophet, the prophet or the man who was the truthful, the trustworthy individual. Because he cared about the individual who was being oppressed. This is him before Prophethood. Now, during his prophethood, in the 13 years that he spent in Mecca, all of the messages of unity, all of the messages related to mannerism were being given in the Qur'an, one after another, after another, after another. Everything, basically. The burying of the young orphan girls, the oppression of the orphans, riba, zina, theft, murder, everything was being addressed in the Meccan Qur'an. But not in a, in a legal standpoint, but in just in the manner of addressing the akhlaq of the people so that we can have a cohesive society. This is basically when you saw after all of these years of messages that are being inculcated among the Sahaba, you saw the result of that. How? You had the likes of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was freeing slaves and spending thousands of dinars. Imagine, you have thousands and thousands of your own personal dollars that you're spending, freeing the individuals who are being persecuted. What do you think made him do that? He, Abu Bakr did all of that. He freed the likes of Bilal. He freed the likes of Ammar ibn Yasir. Abu Fakih or Abu Fakih. He freed slave after slave who were, who were being persecuted by the oppressive leadership in Mecca. Why? Because he saw them just by purely, by saying La ilaha illallah, he saw their pain as his own pain. There was a level of empathy that was unmatched. Why? Because they shared the same creed. This is what united them. This is what came out as a result of all of the years of tarbiyah that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was giving in Mecca at times in secret and at times in public. And subhanAllah, after migration in Medina, you saw an even more intensified version of this unity. Because the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was now the head of a state. Now you had a bunch of Muslims who had given him the go-ahead to come. Come and lead the efforts of justice. Implement Tawheed. Implement the systems that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has basically been revealing to him for 13 years. Now it came in the form of actual institutions. So what did he do? The first project was an intellectual and spiritual unity inculcated. And the main project that facilitated that was what? Who can guess? Who can guess the first project which unified the spirit and the intellect of the Muslims in Medina? What was the first project that he, that he did? 
building the mosque. They, the first thing that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa do in Medina, build the mosque and make it the epicenter. And this is something that we need to learn as those who are leading the communities, that we need to make the masjid the epicenter of support. That was the institution in which the tarbiyah of the Muslims took place. That was the institution that anybody who needed any kind of financial support, for example, they would come and have a place, a quarter dedicated to them. These are known as the Ahl Sufta. The ones who were poor, they couldn't afford to basically live and have a shelter. They had a quarter in the masjid to, to live. That was the epicenter of education. That was the epicenter of support if there was any kind of dispute or trouble. Anytime there was a rumor that was happening in Medina, for example, that threatened the unity of the Muslims, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would call the Muslims to come. He would stand on the member and address them and clarify the matter. So that the people go home with their hearts intact. With their hearts not having these ill feelings festering year after year. No. He addressed any kind of doubt, any kind of oppression that might have been taking place. Any kind of uh, sin that might be brewing, for example. Anything that threatened the community, he addressed it from the, the masjid. This was the spiritual and intellectual hub. Then you also had the second project that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did in Medina. And that was social unity. He did that by basically making the Ansar and the Muhajireen brothers of one another. You had imagine you had hundreds who came and migrated from Mecca to Medina. In order to facilitate and join their hearts together, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam basically took one man from the Muhajireen and one man from the Ansar and made them brothers to the point that they were inheriting from one another until that was abrogated by, the, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on. Who remembers some of the famous brotherly pairs that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made in Medina? There's some really big names that we can draw upon. Who remembers one of them? Where you had one Ansar and one Muhajir together. Anybody? No? So you had the likes of, for example, Ammar ibn Yasir and Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, subhanAllah. You had Abdurrahman ibn Auf and Sa'd ibn Rabi' together. SubhanAllah, you had Sa'd ibn Mu'ad and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. Massive, yani, these are massive figures in the Ummah. These are the individuals who gave victory to the Ummah in the decades to come. These are the individuals who freed the lands of the Romans and the Persians. These are the individuals who ended up freeing the lands like Bayt al-Maqdis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the Muslims who are in those lands today. These are the individuals who ended up doing that. Why? Because they saw their struggle the same as the struggle of somebody else, another Muslim who was also struggling. They had no problem giving half their wealth they had no problem. Sa'd ibn Rabih is the famous one who offered half of his wealth to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Take it. And this wasn't forced. They did it out of their own yani, sense of generosity. They knew that these are the brothers that they need to support. SubhanAllah, you see a level of generosity that is unmatched. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this about the Ansar. That they favored, subhanAllah, they gave itha, they favored the muhajireen even among, even above their, their own self. Even when they themselves were in need, subhanAllah. This is a level of generosity that built eventually success rather than failure. We, sometimes we think that when we give to others our time, our expertise, our money, our this and that, we, we might see it as a loss for us. But that's not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the act of char charity and generosity and he multiplies it. يَمْحَقَ اللَّهُ الرِّبَا وَيُرْبِ الصَّدَقَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with regards to riba that he will destroy it. But with sadaqat, you will multiply it. There's a multiplying effect of sadaqa. Because once you help somebody else, that individual, once he stands upon his own two feet, is going to help somebody else. And so on and so forth. There's a trickle down effect. This is what creates success. And this is what we saw again and again. 
when it came to the Sahaba. And subhanAllah, you see the third type of unity in Medina as well, which is a political unity, an economic, a military unity as well. When years after the Rasul passed away, when there was a civil conflict that happened among the Sahaba, and you had the likes of Ali radiallahu anhu and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu having a civil conflict with one another. You had the Roman Empire, the Caesar in Rome, trying to exploit this disunity that was uh, yani brewing. He wanted to exploit it further. So he goes to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and he says, I will arm you, I will give you support against your brother, brother Ali. What did Muawiyah say? Radiallahu anhu. Muawiyah told the, the leaders of the Roman Empire, get lost, get lost. I will never, I will never take your support against my own brother. Yes, you might have, for example, two brothers arguing in, in a conflict at times. This happens in every family, for example. You have, for example, a brother and a sister. Sometimes we get into an argument. But does that mean that we're going to basically go inside with our own enemies against our own, uh, our own brethren? Absolutely not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed the believers are only, brother, uh, only brethren. The title that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the believers is not that of neighbors. Is that not, not, not that of co-workers. It's not that of family relatives. The title that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes for the believers is only, only brothers. No, no other. And that's why the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanAllah, in his farewell hajj, in his farewell hajj, when he was standing in front of a hundred thousand companions in hajj, in Arafah, he gave one of the greatest khutbas ever in human history. What was the last message? After all, after emphasizing and summarizing the message of Islam, of supporting the, supporting the community, of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of taking care of your families and then taking care of your women and this and all of the summarized message he ends by saying that indeed the Muslim is a brother to another Muslim that the Muslimin are brother to one another that was the finality of the message even in that khutbah of the Rasul this is how important it was this is how he ended the, khut- the final khutbah in the farewell hajj Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's how important this topic is. I think we're a little bit short on time now. We have five minutes. We have five minutes. So one thing that we can basically extract from that for our times here, especially as Western minorities, Muslims who are living in Western countries as minorities, how can we basically take that lesson and implement it in our own life? The first message that we can easily take is to control the resources that we at least have right now. And that involves, for example, taking the masjid and as we said, making it the epicenter of the Muslims. One calamity that unfortunately we have today is if you have a Muslim who is in need, either financial need or if let's say he's in uh, a psychological peril, for example, he may have mental health issues or this or that, any kind of issues. The last place they actually look to for solutions and help, unfortunately, is the masjid. I'm not talking about this masjid. I'm talking about in general, in the West, and even in the East as well. Muslims, unfortunately, today will go to every single place, the state, the clinics, the banks, this and that, for help. Why? We need to make basically the the masjid in the West, in the Western minority populations, the epicenter of education, the epicenter of support for our Muslims. If we don't do that, who else is going to do it? If we don't give yani, the, the resources that are necessary to our immediate community's needs, and each community has its own unique set of challenges. If the masjid is not the place to do it, then how can we possibly uh, serve and leave behind any kind of legacies to come? And one solution that is given is to emphasize the importance of endowments, for example. Endowments, waqf or awqaf, an endowment fund that basically can be set up in order to take care uh, and fund the projects that are happening in a particular city, community or locality. 
But in order to have those awqaf, you need to have a level of trust built between the leaders and the followers. You need to have a generation of individuals who see a level of trust that once we do support these kinds of initiatives, that they're actually doing it for the sake of the jama'ah. They're not doing it to fill their own pockets. They're not doing it to basically turn the deen into a capital, capitalistic endeavor. No. So this is one solution that we can take out of it. The second aspect is to invest thoroughly, thoroughly in Islamic education. This is something that cannot be discounted or diminished in any way, shape or form. We have, alhamdulillah, institutions ready. Now it's the time to facilitate and have a proper organized structure in order to facilitate disseminating knowledge and investing in certain individuals who are handpicked, who have certain competencies that are demonstrated to be able to build them over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Again, this requires a longer term approach, which is something that we see again and again from the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, when we have time, we'll expand a little bit more of, about what that actually looks like. We just gave a little bit of a, of, of a summary in this particular halaqah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate the communities around us and to strengthen the communities around us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to engage in activities that are accepted by Him and that are in line with the priorities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep the hearts of those who are young, firm, especially young and old, men and women, firm upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firm upon Tawheed and firm for the next generation to rise. A generation that inshallah will be the, the caretakers of the community. The ones who will be given victory inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who are given victory in this dunya and in akhirah. Allahumma ameen. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك وجزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته